All right, thank you, Mahindra, for the introduction. Um, so today I'm gonna to be speaking on the xenofree derivation and maintenance of pluripotent cell lines. Uh, this is something we've been working on uh, in developing medias with uh, life technologies and in vitro gen for the last year and a half. So George Daly gave a much better, more eloquent background on the state of embryonic stem cell research. But in the 70s, they started out with the first embryonal carcinoma line. Um, moving on to 1981, of course, Evans, Coffin, and Martin had the first mouse embryonic stem cell line. And then 98 was Jamie Thompson with the first human, human embryonic stem cell line. And then 2006, the revolution by Yamanaka of making induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, closely followed by 2007, Thompson and Yamanaka having human iPS cells. So the next step is really moving towards therapy, and that's kind of what I want to focus on with my work. So what we need is we need clinic-ready human embryonic stem cells or human-induced pluripotent stem cells to move forward in clinical applications. Um, so to do that, you need GMP derivation, uh, and that's good manufacturing practice, and that's more of a process than it is actually the components used to make these cells. Um, so we're focusing more on the components that could be then applied for a GMP certification. <laughs> Uh, and one important factor there is xeno-free products. Can you remove animal products that could add contamination or difficulty in the regulatory process for approval? So available now, as of last week, um, there's 122 NIH certified lines. Um, and the first GMP certified are ESI 014 and 017. Uh, so some of these lines are coming up and available for both funding and for hopefully future clinical use. But the more lines that we get uh, in clinical grade mediums or component systems, it will only expand our ability to move forward with therapy. So our xenofree culture system really starts out with an extracellular matrix as our base along the plastic support both the fibroblasts and our feeder layers and as well as the pluripotent cell lines. So I've used human vitronectin and fibronectin as my extracellular matrix. Um, and then human dermal fibroblasts for my feeder layer and then, of course, developing a xenofree culture medium. So the human vitronectin and fibronectin, uh, native human vitronectin costs commercially $2 million a gram. And for those of you who've seen the movie Avatar, you'll know that that's more expensive than unobtainium. And uh, I'm not flying to Pandora for this stuff. So I had to figure out how to get it myself. Uh, and we can do a very simple protein column isolation procedure and I was able to obtain human plasma from the blood bank at University of Southern California. Um, and uh, so after the IRB, you get about five milligrams of this per bag. Um, and five milligrams is quite enough to do some expanded culture of these cell lines. Uh, but you know, uh, we've, we've got about 100 milligrams hopefully stocked up. Uh, and then the native human fibronectin, this is affordable commercially from Gibco, another life technologies product. Uh, that's actually not correct. It's actually 60,000 per gram. But again, we're using milligram quantities of it. So it's within the scope of our, our research funding and something that would be affordable, I think, for large-scale culture of these. Um, and the reason we're using vitronectin is the RGD fragment uh, or binding site is, uh, works with alpha V uh, beta 5 integrin and has been shown to support human embryonic and pluripotent stem, stem cell growth. Uh, so we use this at 0.5 milligrams per, excuse me, micrograms per centimeter squared. And uh, so that's our initial extracellular matrix conditions. For the human feeders, uh, I commercially sourced uh, human embryonic dermal fibroblasts from Science Cell. Um, and then we also use a xeno-free or serum-free fibroblast medium from ATCC. And then it comes with a growth factor serum-free kit. Um, and that works pretty well for the propagation of these cells. But by P7 in this ser xenofree, serum-free conditions, they really start to senesce, and so they don't work very well. So you gotta use really early passage, but early passage feeders are better for the culture of these cells anyways. And I'm using five times 10 to the fourth, so 50,000 cells per, per centimeter squared. Okay, the xenofree medium, this is the one that really we worked on the most. Um, and so it's the knockout serum replacement xenofree CTS medium, which has recently become available commercially from Life Technologies. Uh, we use a standard DMMF12 base medium, and then we're adding 20% of the knockout serum replacer. And uh, to that, we're adding uh, animal component free BFGF from Millipore at 10 nanograms per ml. And we're using beta mercapto ethanol, MEM, non essential amino acids, penstrep, and L glutamine. So it's a standard KSR cocktail, except we have humanized components added to it. Okay, so how do these cells look in these medias? 
If you see in the top left panel, we have uh, two growth factor components that Life Technologies is developing. One was a 50x growth factor cocktail, and one was a 100x, and they kind of switched to the 100x for stability um, midway through the beta testing that I was doing. But if you look at those top two panels, you can see that the colonies themselves look similar between the 50x and the 100x growth factor cocktail at both passage 12 and passage 16. After eight passages in Xeno Free, we wanted to move back to the standard KSR because we noticed that there were slight morphological differences in the shape of the colonies. But you can see that uh, you know, overall morphology is pretty similar at the gross level. And then from the standard KSR, we moved back to a meth uh, condition, but in KSR. And we got back to what the cells normally look like, more meths, more flat. The cells become more rounded rather than angular. When I do some immunohistochemistry or cytochemistry on these cells, um, you can see that after seven passages of xenofree that we have pluripotency markers that are expressed uniformly across these colonies, SSCA4 and NANOG, TRA160 and OC4, and GCTM2 and SOX2. So after seven passages, it appears that these cells retain, you know, markers that are, that are indicative of pluripotency. And then after 17 passages, uh, I also stain for ECADherin, EPCAM, and DNMT3B, and you can see that you have very strong staining for all of these. Uh, at that 17 passages, I also stain for the factors I looked at before, and they remain positive for those. So I did a quick uh, expression analysis and doing a relative quantification versus the HES3s that I switched back to the standard KSR. Um, and then I wanted to look to see if there's any differences between the HES3s that were grown in the 50X cocktail or the 100X cocktail compared to that. And if we just closely look at the uh, pluripotency tr uh, transcription factors and some secreted factors as well, you can see that there's pretty tight expression between the different conditions of KSR and the Xenofree. Although there are some differences between the Xenofree and the standard KSR. But when you look at the 50X and the 100X uh, differences in the medium, you can see that where they're different, they track together. So the 50X and the 100X growth factor cocktail were equally supportive in terms of the expression profile. So kind of the HES summary, uh, and this is more the development of uh, the Xenofree medium. HES3 are currently passaged to P21, and they continue to be passaged in the lab. Uh, the 50X and the 100X growth factor cocktail are equivalent, so this new 100X has recently become commercially available, so it should be able to be used at the same conditions we're using. Um, and I begin testing HES2s, H1s, and H9s. Um, we have put H9s on for a few passages, but haven't done any further characterization of them so far. So conclusion, Xenofree KSR Z, uh, CTS from Life Technologies is a viable Xenofree medium for long-term maintenance of HES cells, especially HES3s. So we wanted to next, after describing and, and beta testing this media, see if we could derive Xenofree IPS from these conditions. Uh, I went ahead and used the piggyback transposome method because we wanted to use something that was a possibility of being transgene-free. And uh, the thing about it, it holds about 10 kilobytes as efficiently, so you can do the full reprogramming cassette. The most important is that it can insert and cleave without a trace, and so we wanted to try to develop these cell lines. Uh, it's a two-plasmid system, so one thing that's good about that is we can use transfection uh, electroporation technology from Maxa, and it becomes a cheap solution to making IPS because you can bulk up these plasmids and use them on demand. Um, and so basically the schematic on the right there, you can see that the piggyback will insert into our human dermal fibroblasts, which we're using as the base, the same cells we're using as feeders. Um, and then you can hopefully remove the transposon later, although we're currently working on that right now. Uh, the transposon setup that I actually used was from USA et al., the 2009 Nature Methods paper. So kind of the reprogramming timeline. At day zero, we used the Amaxa nucleofection device uh, on P2 to P4 human dermal fibroblasts. Uh, one thing I did do is these cells are made xenofree, but the first passages of their lifespan is actually done in a serum-containing medium. And this was actually done because the stability of the cells grown in that serum-free or xenofree uh, fibroblast medium weren't amenable to transfection by the different technologies that I used. Uh, so I ended up using a serum-containing media for propagation of these feeders early and found that they were more amenable to transfection. But after that day five, uh, I did you know, some phase contrast here. And you see that you can notice the what I call reprogramming foci, but also they're the mesenchymal to epithelial transition uh, that was previously described, uh, I, I believe, two days ago. Um, and then after day five, I switched to the knockout uh, serum replacement, Xenofree. And so it's, 
it's xeno-free after that initial transfection in five days in that medium. And then, oops, excuse me. After that point, I select, um, and this is an image of a colony that I selected, and by morphology, it was nice and round. It looked ES-like, and this is what I picked at day 32. But I've picked anywhere from day 20 up to day 40 and had success in generating IPS lines. And then, of course, we passage them and characterize. So total to date, I've got 12 IPS lines xeno-free that we've derived and uh, started initial characterization on them. The three lines highlighted in red are the ones that I've had the most characterization done. And uh, to note, the K1 and K1 ENR, ENR stands for enriched. This line is actually, I've been able to split into two propagatable cell lines, one which looks partially reprogrammed and one which is fully reprogrammed. And so to look at J1 uh, at P4, you could see that those same markers that I saw on the xenofree ES pluripotency markers were the same, although there were slight morphological dis differences in the fact that these IPS colonies seem to be a little more dense. Um, and so that gross morphological uh, differentiation between the IPS and the HES were, was noticed, but overall the pluripotency marker expression was the same. And of course at P13, I looked at ECAT here in EPCAM and DNMT3B and saw strong staining for those as well. So kind of an overall look at the, the patterning or excuse me, the expression analysis uh, by ICC for the Xenofree IPS and the lines that I have. Uh, you can see that the first three lines have been most characterized for these nuclear and surface markers, but some of these other lines have also done initial characterization as well. Some of them are being slower to expand, so it's harder to get enough material, but there, there are differences in proliferation rates of some of these lines. And we've used different uh, fibroblast backgrounds, and it seems that there may be some line dependency in terms of their proliferation rate. So when I did a qPCR for the IPS, um, what I wanted to look at here was, again, the HES-3s grown in the KSR standard conditions, and then look at the IPS lines, especially J1 and the 50X and the 100X growth factor cocktail. And again, there were slight differences between the IPS and the, and the standard HES line that I was using, although where the 50X and the 100X growth factor cocktail were concerned in green and red, you can see that those differences track together, suggesting that it was a cell line dependent and not a media dependent difference in the expression. And then, of course, you see the K1 in purple, and this is the partially reprogrammed line. And what was interesting with this line was that uh, you had a very decreased expression in most of the pluripotency markers, except for SOX2. And then when you looked at the differentiation marker uh, for neural lineage, PAC6, you saw a very strong expression difference there, suggesting that this K1 partially reprogrammed line is of the neural lineage. And when you look at the morphology grossly of this K1 line at passage 15, you can see that it doesn't retain its tight borders and also has a more diffuse and smaller nuclei. It looks more neural. And then it, just spontaneous differentiation, you can see that it begins to shoot out neural processes. I haven't done any characterization for staining of these, but I hope to do so very shortly. So a summary for the IPS, we have the 12 IPS lines derived xeno-free. We have two of these lines passaged to P16, and it appears that we have fully and partially reprogrammed lines that exhibit varied RNA expression patterns, but also it's important is that this partially reprogrammed line is passaging in the xeno-free medium long term. So it seems that we may be able to support partially reprogrammed or differentiated states long term uh, in this medium. And overall, xenofree CTS uh, is a viable xenofree medium for derivation and long-term maintenance of IPSCs. So once we saw that we could make the IPSs, we wanted to see if we could use this technology for the derivation of human embryonic stem cells. So to get our embryos, we worked with the University of Southern California Fertility Clinic. Uh, they had surplus embryos in storage from a previous study, but we wanted to start consenting these for our new project because of the new guidelines that came with the NIH certification. So we started in fall 2009, and unfortunately, we've only been able to obtain 62 of these embryos because of the difficulty in obtaining consent uh, at the level of the new guidelines. Uh, so we got to consent more, but we're hoping that we'll be able to do this over the next year and have some good results. So here's, you know, photomicrographs of the of one donor patient line that we've had, which is SC011. And uh, I'm kind of going to go over the quality of these embryos. If you look at E, you can see that that's a very low quality embryo whereas F would be more of a high-quality embryo. And you can see that it has a well-developed ICM. The trophectoderm is intact, as well as the zona pellucida is thin, all qualities of a very healthy embryo. Uh, these were frozen at 2 p.m. stage, so they were thawed and then developed in, our, in the actual fertility clinic laboratory before we transferred them over to us. 
Um, and you can see slight fragmentation of some of the cells in there, but overall it looks like a pretty good line. Um, and the rest of them you can see are in varied states of development. Uh, one of the biggest problems we have is that the embryo quality has been low and most of, the, most of them appear to have the morphology and overall criteria of E. So to do this xeno-free, so previous isolation of intercell mass was using immunosurgery, which of course uses antibodies, and that would have preclude it from being a xeno-free or, or moving on in that situation. So we needed a mechanical way of dissociating these cells and enriching the ICM. So a paper done by a former student of Martin Para, and he's now in Israel, he was used a basically laser they would use for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and resourced it and repurposed it to basically open up the embryo with mechanically and then enrich for the ICM. So it's a infrared laser, it's mounted to a 40X objective and I do have a video of this. If, uh so here's actual video. Oh, it seems to be going a little slow so we'll go, we'll look at this and see how it, far we can get into it with timing. But you can see that as the embryo is moved across the plane of the laser because it's fixed in the objective, so I actually have to use a joystick methodology to move the embryo itself. The laser works uh, in it by exciting water molecules which will then ablate the protonaceous structures. So it's got, really got to be on a focal plane. So since this is a 3D structure, you have to both be able to move the embryo up and down or mat stretch it out into a flatter plane to get the laser to work most efficiently. Um, but you can see that uh, there are short pulses that are ablating. If you look at the very bottom, you can see where the zona pellucida has started to open up. And then once we've removed the zona pellucida, we can then go in and actually uh, cut the remaining trophectoderm that we're not interested in and try to enrich for the inner cell mass. So we'll watch a few more seconds of this. Unfortunately, it appears that the uh, program that's being run has slowed the video down by 4x. It's usually much faster than this. <laughs> So I think we can stop there and we'll just go ahead and move forward. What you would have seen is that once this embryo was fully isolated, you would see the first panel at day zero. And you can see there that on the left pipette that I've cut off a large amount of that trophectoderm and on the right there's mostly inner cell mass but it is surrounded by some trophectoderm. As I apply it to the culture system that we developed on day two, you can see that we have attachment. Uh, of that isolated chunk that would be on the right of that first image. And then you can see that we have expansion of a cell type going around that central attachment area by day three. 24, hour later, 24 hours later you see a much stronger expansion of what we think is trophectoderm. Uh, of course we haven't identified that by any staining. And then by day six what you can see is there's looks to be two different cell types in this. On the outer edges you can see this trophectodermal cells but there's this intersection of cells which we figure is the ICM. Unfortunately, the trophectodermal cells grow very rapidly in this culture system, and they actually will begin to go 3D in terms of their expansion. And so they get to a certain point, and they start growing up, and then they start aggregating and detaching. This seems to be an inhibitory to both our ICM expansion and possibly it can cause detachment so that the ICM may no longer be attached to the vitronectin or exposed to the extracellular matrix. So in this case, I tried to pluck out that inner cell mass and get reattachment, but I was unable to have that be achieved. So we think that the cell culture methodology is still viable, and we'd like to continue using it. Unfortunately, we just had a very few, small section of embryos that are actually viable and have grown into a good condition for us to use it. So in the future, we'd like to establish human embryonic stem cell lines, and then we'd like to characterize our pluripotent lines more, both the xenofree IPS as well as any future ES we have. So we'd like to do embryo body teratoma formation. We'd like to do a full epigenetic profile with the alumina infinium platform, which is now up to about 500,000 CPG uh, sites that you can, you can profile. And then, of course, karyotype analysis of these cells after long-term culture. Uh, to acknowledge uh, the para lab, of course, Martin Para, uh, Koichi Hasegawa, who's in attendance here, Alex Kwas is a ob fellow working for me, and Jordan Reese is an intern who's done some great work with the staining. Uh, and then, of course, my funding sources uh, and life technologies. So thank you very much. I'll open it up to any questions.